sell out. Don't compromise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you have anything that's spiritually guided in any level of exercise that is uh, um, from, the, from the East, you know, uh, you got to understand that there may be a, a clear spiritual, you know, it's like a Ouija board. Are you going to get demonized the first time you do it? No, but probably not. But are you going to open doors? Yeah. Can you get demonized and bring something in through a Ouija board, a spirit board, a talking board, as they called it when they originated it? Because that's what it was created for, to be a gateway for a spirit to talk. So, again, be willing. Why, why hold on to anything that, that would quench the spirit of God, grieve the spirit of the Lord, vex the Holy One of Israel? when we know that it comes from the dark side. I mean, if you understand the dark side, then be outraged. Uh, David and Goliath, the warriors were up in the rocks. God didn't speak to the ones hiding in the rocks. God didn't give victory to the ones in the rocks. But when David went onto the field, in the name of the Lord, that's where God acted. And that's the way Christians gotta be. You gotta be very clear and be uh, fighting for the souls of men. But with authority and righteousness, fighting and praying against. The early church, when they were going from town to town, they are leading people to Christ and, and stopping the demonic worship and getting them to, you know, temples came down. You gotta remember that all this occurred. Uh, they were getting rid of the stuff. Remember the one place they preached and then they brought all their witchcraft books and everything. They came up to some, what was it, $50,000 in our terms? I forget. Um, and they burned it all. And some people, that's crazy to burn it all. No, really? I think it's crazy not to. <laughs> okay, where, 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 go ahead. One question. Yeah. 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 Yep, I'm not going to even get into that right here. That's not, that's not a matter of spiritual warfare, yeah. We're going to get into the Masons, though. Uh, the Masons uh, were brought up here a couple of times. Let me say this. No Christian, no pastor, no deacon should be a Mason. You can't be a Christian and a Mason at the same time. You cannot. Masonic doctrine teaches Jesus is not God. They de-deify him. Salvation isn't directly through Jesus. Oh, they'll be nice to you in the beginning to say, you can go to your church, do whatever else, because they purposely targeted pastors and leaders in the SBC and other places for years and years and years and years. Just look at their doctrines. Just look at their inside temple. Look at the veneration of the Vedas and the Quran and the Bible all put together. Look at what's actually done. I mean, it's a society. I mean, get rid of the idea, well, it's just a bunch of men getting together or whatever else. Get, get way beyond that and look at the doctrine. Are you under the lordship of Christ and, and, and committed to the God of heaven alone? Um, because if you say, well, I am, but I'm also going to be a mason. Well, then you, some of your first rituals with the blindfold, I'm in darkness. And you do the thing and the shaking. And then I'm coming out into the light, Masonic light. That's Luciferian light. I've got dogmas and morals. I've got Albert Pike's book. He says Lucifer's the good guy. Lucifer's the light bearer. Lucifer's coming to give, you know, um, all the elite knowledge to humanity. Lucifer's the good one. Jesus is the little imp. Is that who we want to follow? So please understand that when it comes to any of the secret societies, the reason they're secret, and they've always, anytime there's occultism, it's always, what does occult mean? Hidden. Secret. The mysterium, the secret power, the hidden, the mystery, the hidden uh, system. So there's a reason why there are 56,000 Masonic temples in the United States, one in every single city and township, everywhere, every, every, by design. Inside the temples, some of the deepest occult objects and symbols and uh, designed rituals, Egyptian, from the Nephilim themselves. You, you, those are all doorways to those spirits, all doorways to that side. And so, let me give you a scripture concerning this. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. What fellowship is there between the temple of God and Belial? What fellowship between light and darkness? You know, we're told in that section, uh, touch no unclean thing in the context of occult objects and occult teaching and occult things. So if you're Masonic, it's time to renounce it and get out of it and surrender all to Jesus. We know a lot of people that come out of Masonic, there's a lot of books now from higher up uh, Masons that will tell you what they were into and what it really is when you go way up the lines. And um, 
it is some of the deepest occult doctrine and teaching. And what is the evidence of the spirit of Antichrist? Any system that teaches that Jesus is not God and that he's not a direct savior. And the Masons are going to teach you that Jesus is not God and that he is not direct salvation. That you go through an evolutionary development like the Gnostics. And that is not of God. That is of the spirit of Antichrist. And you've got to get out. It would be a good day to do that. Uh, I want to take you over real quick here because of our time issues. We're going to be on page 25, I think that is. Where did my little glasses go? 25. Yeah, there's a lot of subjects. That we, I mean, we, we'd love to answer a lot of subjects. <laughs> a lot of incredibly good questions that came up here. Um, but we just, we're, just, we're, just, we're supposed to be out of here in 25 minutes. And we haven't, we haven't even gotten to the part where we're going to stand and pray and do things. And we've got the practical side of all this to do yet. Um, so uh, we, if, if we're allowed, we might, I don't know when the cleaners or whatever are coming in. So uh, let's take a look. 25 at the very beginning. Clearing yourself from the demonic freedom encounters as we call it. Um, Psalm 139 where there's a portion in there that says, Search me, O God, and see if there is any, you know, any un, you know, anything offensive uh, inside. And then lead me in the way everlasting. Okay. So uh, that's why I'm saying that all of us as believers can do this for a number of reasons. The Spirit of God, according to Romans 8, is inside of you to lead you, to guide you, to put to death, to mortify the deeds of the sin nature, the flesh. Put them out. But I would also say that would include getting rid of anything of the world, the fallen world, the flesh issues, and then the demonic satanic stuff. Warfare is all three, but all three of those are connected. 1 John chapter 5 tells us the evil one is in control of the whole world. The word world in the book of uh, 1 John used numerous times is cosmos. In reference to the world there, it means the fallen world system. Not the trees and the deer and the horses. I love all that. But it's the fallen world system. Do not love the fallen world system and the things of the world. You know, anybody loves that? Is, the love of the Father is not in them, right? The lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, lust of, you know, pride of life. All of that is from, you know, that's from the flesh. That's from the fallen world system. We're told in Romans 12 to make, a, make our lives a, a living sacrifice. Uh, that, that what would happen then in, in the renewing of our minds. That we're not to conform to the patterns of the world. So the fallen world system will suck you in, water you down, keep you busy from serving Jesus, um, you know, whatever it may be, whether it's just simply greed, whether it's just popularity, whether it's just pure uh, unrighteous um, ambitions and other things the world would love to suck you in. And then there's the old sin nature issue, that when we get saved, the sin nature is rendered powerless, but we can be drawn back into sins. In, you know, we're told so in Galatians, you know, don't walk in the, in the flesh. If you, know, if, if you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the, the lusts of the flesh. Flesh doesn't mean skin. It means the sin, the old fallen nature. Sarks is the word. So the old, that old nature. Um, does the world try to entice the old nature to come, get you to come back to the old thing? Sure. Does Satan try to tempt you on the exact things you were once in? Sure. You heard Mike that when he was going through difficulties, his thing was that he felt being pushed to go back to the same old thing. Okay? The same old thing. Go back to it. So let's take a look. At the moment of salvation, let's go through this kind of quickly too. At salvation, the breaking occurs. And I want to give you Colossians chapter 1, from verse 10 on down. You're going to read that in salvation, we have been um, uprooted from the dominion of darkness. And we have been transferred over. The word has this powerful word of transferred over to. Uh, transferred over to the basileia of, of Christ. The basileia of the Son of God. So in salvation, you've been uprooted from that dominion. He no longer has ownership over you. And now you're under the ownership of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're in the kingdom, the basileia of God. You're in one or the other. So, in salvation, you've been uprooted and shifted over. Now, in salvation, instantaneous forgiveness. Inseparable from permanent freedom. Romans 6, you have been set free, you have been set free, you have been set free, you have been set free from sin. The sin nature has been rendered powerless. We finally read in Romans 6, count yourself dead to sin or reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Why? Because you are. But appropriation of that. Romans 6, as you begin to read, it just got done telling you through all those verses 
then the application is, hey, Jesus came in my life and gave me total forgiveness, but he also set me free from the sin nature that bound me in sin. Please understand something. You don't have to sin. I'm not saying you never have. I'm not calling anyone here sinless. How many have sinned in the last 20 minutes? Three of you. Okay. Well, let me give you 1 John 1, 9. <laughs> let me tell you something. I mean, we might not know at times when we do or don't. I mean, we, you know, sins that we should have been doing something. But what I'm saying is, um, and I, you know, there, you, you don't know of any direct sin that you did. What I'm saying, you've been delivered. Don't go around saying, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, if you're saved. No, please do not do that. Romans chapter 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has, Greek aorist, permanently set me free from the law of sin and death. You've been, you, that, that old nature has been severed. You now have a dominant new nature. The nature of God in Christ inside. Operative, victory, the ability to grow. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3, his divine power in you, present, uh, present and resident in you, has given you everything you need for life, zoe, Christ-like life, and eusebia, committed to God, godliness committed to God, through our knowledge of him who saved us. So, you know, salvation means everything. It's the, it's the ground, it's the, it's the bottom of everything. Everything else comes from this. So we have been saved, we have been justified, Romans 5. Just as if you had never sinned. You are being sanctified, growing and growing. The Spirit of God is moving you to be more like Christ and to do what Christ did. And then you will be glorified. Is your glorification based on your sanctification or on your justification? Glorification is based on justification. Your name is written in the book of, Lamb's Book of Life because you have been saved by the merits of Christ. Sanctification just makes it a lot better for you along the way. It does have rewards. Judgment seat of Christ for all of us. We're all going to appear before the Bema seat of Christ as believers to see what we've done. What are you doing with your giftings? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with the Holy Spirit in your life? What are you doing with soul winning? What are you doing with discipleship? What are you doing? As a Christian, I'll stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. It doesn't have anything to do with my salvation. I'm in. It has everything to do, though, with how I lived it. What do you want said? There is, there is nothing, nothing better than to give a life completely to Christ. You can't gain more. You can't gain any, any sense more. Um, what greater thing do you have to live for? Salvation is the breaking in of Jesus Christ. Uh, it is the deliverance from Satan's rights, deliverance from the uh, bondage of the sin nature, is a uh, deliverance from death and hell. Only Jesus could say, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone believe in me? Though he die, yet shall he live. None of us will die like a non-Christian that are Christians here. Okay? Ecclesiastes 12, 7, everybody that dies, their spirit goes back before God. Uh, Hebrews 9, 20, what, what, what do we read in Hebrews? It is appointed a man wants to die. After that, what? Are you saved or are you lost? Because if you're lost, afterwards, there's no second chance. If you spit in the face of God now, if you resist the spirit of God now, if you say no to God now, you will not get him on the other side lost forever and that's a tragedy book of e Ezekiel where it says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather they would turn God didn't want you to, to go to hell God is not willing that anybody perish but that all would come to repentance right that is the heart of God that is the heart of God. So the breaking in is in including uh, that we've been transferred to the kingdom of God. The ownership that we're in now, the, we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. It's a seal of uh, a recognition of ownership. Now God, we are God, our body, we're God's, we're His. 
His spirit bears witness our spirit that we are the children of God. 1 John 3, you know, look how much love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. And we are! That's what it says in the Greek. That's how it does in the Greek. We are! It just, it just brings out the emotion that you really are, child of God. And um, he knows you. So in thinking of this, and sometimes I've been thinking too, you know, when we lead people to Jesus, if I lead a Wiccan to Christ, a Druid to Christ, a Buddhist to Christ, a Satanist to Christ, we had a guy up in, up in Cleveland we led to Christ named Lanny years ago, and he was a full-blown just into Satanism, blah, 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 he's bo boasting, blah, 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 he's in the car, I've got power, I got, I'm going to be the next Anton LaVey, I'm going to be the Black Pope, blah, he's just going on and on and on. I finally got sick of it, I said, Lanny, you know, if you've got all these powers and all the women and all the money, and you're a Satanist, you're going to be this big wig, why did you call us little peons from Akron, Ohio, these Christians from, you know, Akron to come up to Cleveland to deal with you. And I could see him in the mirror looking and his countenance went completely down. He says, because I have no joy. We got out of the car at the church. He couldn't go inside. He sat on the grass. We preached the gospel, preached the gospel. I said, Lanny, you ready to come to Christ and exchange the darkness for light, exchange the power of Satan for God? And Lanny says, yes. I said, okay. Pray out right now. Jesus, come into my life. Just let's start praying right now. And the moment he said the J in Jesus, a demon took him, seized him, and threw him to the ground, growling. Three of us around began to unleash prayers. He was released within 15, 16, 17 seconds. And he finished the statement. Jesus Christ, come into my life, forgive me. I renounce Satan. I renounce the dark side. I renounce Satan. Jesus, come into my life and save me and, and let your spirit come into my life. And Lanny got saved that night. We stayed with him. We took him out to eat afterwards. I remember about an hour and a half later, I looked over. I said, look, I just pointed at Lanny. I said, look at him. Uh, two hours ago, he had this scrawly, old, arrogant, depressed face. Right now, he's beam. His smile is, I mean, he just, his, you could see the difference in countenance, let alone the fact that he's saved now. Uh, that's what happens. That's what Paul said to the king. He says to turn them from the power of Satan to God, from darkness to light. And that's, that's what happens when we get saved. So sometimes when I have people that are into stuff, New Age, I have them, when they, when, they, when they receive Christ and believe on Jesus, renounce anything, renounce anything that God wants you to renounce, anything of the dark side too. You know, if you're a Satanist, renounce Satan right now as you're giving your life to Jesus. Let's close doors now so you won't have a bunch of problems for the next six months. A lot of Christians have been having problems for years because things haven't been known to be re renounced too, right? So let's take a look at some of that. Um, the demonic past. Let's look over the bottom of the page. If your family, if your family has anything, and, I, and I'm going to say again, Masonic, I mean, Masonic, secret society, Satanism, occultism, witchcraft, whatever else, then at the very least, the, the spirits think they have a right to you as part of the family, that they want to travel down that family line. And uh, so I have no problem, you know, saying, Lord Jesus, I renounce any spirits that were led in by my parents, my grandparents, any part of my bloodline. Lord, I just, you know, just, you, there's no reason, you, there's, you can cover that. You don't, you know, even if you don't feel affected. Lord, I just want to make sure and cover this. I want to renounce anything from my family line and any spirits having any right. I don't want them to have any effect on me. Secondly, have you opened doors? Ouija board, charms, witchcraft, drugs that, get, that are gateway drugs to spirits. Have you opened the doors? Dating somebody and having sex with somebody that has demons in them. They can transfer them. Being a ghost hunter, chasing, chasing ghosts in buildings. And you know what they're finding out all over the place? All these teams are finding out? These entities are not ghosts and they're coming to their home and afflicting them. You know why? Because you've given them, you've given them a little right, a little access, and they're traveling back, and they're coming to your home, and they're creating, and they want to create fear because fear is a good platform for them to get further into your life. Any open doors? How about associations? I already mentioned that a little bit. People that you're connected to that are demonized in some way. Uh, married to, uh, in your family lines. If you're parents and you have a kid into some kind of Satanism, dark stuff, and they have a little altar, they're bringing stuff in their house, they're, bringing, they're opening the door for demonic stuff in your house. Or if you're a teenager and you have parents that are doing this, vice versa, you know? If you have uh, people that, um, you know, I've had, you know, we've done deliverances in my home, our homes for years. 
you know. So I'm not afraid of that issue, you know, when you know to clear the air in your own home. Jesus, when he cast out demons in locations, he didn't say, okay, you know, sell your business or sell your home, get out of here. No. Um, and this is important. Uh, I want you to be thinking about this because we're going to answer it in a moment. Where do you cast the demons? Good question. Let's come to that in a moment. Does anybody, and just, this is where you're going to mark things down right now. I pray the Spirit of God guide us and the Spirit of God show us the Spirit of God to break anything. We rebuke Satan and the demons in, in Jesus' name right now over everybody. And that uh, there will be no hiddenness here. We ask the Lord to open every doorway to this, uh, to, to, to the, you know, just him throwing the light on the past. Whether family, open doors, associations, trauma and wounds in your life. When you're little and trauma occurs and sexual abuse occurs and beatings occur, sometimes a kid only knows out of the threat and the fear to suppress the pain, the, the traumas, like beach balls down in their life because they don't know how to do anything else but suppress it or split in their personality sometimes. That's even a deeper issue. But to push those things down to when all of a sudden you're 35 years old, those old traumas and those old memories, and that's, they're filled with fear. And whether you like it or not, demons may attach to that because they love the fear and the trauma and the bad stuff. And all of a sudden, you got to deal with that. And, well, I'll just take drugs to suppress it. Now, just, you know, the more your hand's taken off, the older you get, those old things are going to come up. And here's ultimately, if you've gotten saved, Jesus wants to tunnel all the way down to all that area. He is the healer. He is the deliverer. He is the restorer of life. He has the power to bring a, a release there. Some people have pushed things back so much they hardly remember. So that when the, when the toxic thing begins to come up a little bit, you just feel the fear, you feel the panic, you feel the, you feel the, the pain before you even are cognizant of what occurred. And so you've got to take time before the Lord Jesus, and I'm going to tell you right now, he's the greatest healer. The Psalms will give you this, that he's near, you know the word, he's near the brokenhearted. The Hebrew word means he's present. That he heals up the wounds of the brokenhearted, right? He's a healer inwardly of your life too. And sometimes it takes a little time to let him speak in there and bring that up. And, and you can do a little bit of that today by marking down, here's this Lord, here's this Lord. I don't want to give the devil room and I don't want to take up room where the Holy Spirit and life where you want to be to fill me with life. I want this healed. I want to release this. That may involve God saying, here's how I want you to take the perpetrators and just shove them over to me, cast them over to me, release them to me, forgive them, and release them to me. I'll deal with them. You don't have to. Uh, I got this pain I want to bring up. I got these memories. Well, you want to get rid of the memories of all the past and quit trying to just hold them down? You bring them up before the Lord. You will have a little bit of memory. You know, look at them, and then you're going to give them over. You're going to surrender them and ask him to bring healing into your life. When that healing is in your life, you don't have to worry about the memories any longer. There's an exchange. This is light level, really, going over this, but it's very important, very vital for all of us. So it could be the trauma. It could be beliefs that are lies. Do you hold any beliefs inside of you that are actually lies? Ephesians chapter 6, put on the full armor of God, right? Truth, righteousness, what else? Preparedness from the gospel of peace. Helmet of salvation. Lift up the shield of faith by which you can extinguish all the fiery darts of the evil one. How many here clearly know what the fiery darts are? Raise your hand. How many do not know what the fiery darts are? Raise your hand. How many don't know either way, you just didn't want to raise your hand? <laughs> okay. If I was a demon, and I'm not, which is good, and if Rachel was my target and I was here to be the demon, you know what an arrow, if I was going to send a fiery dart, what is a fiery dart? We're going to mark it in the book. Involuntary feelings or thoughts sent to her. To be contrary to the will of God, the word of God, the character of Christ, or the mission of God. So if I was a demon wanting to, there's a cinder behind the, the darts. If you're being hit with lies, if you're being hit with the feelings, God doesn't love me. If you're articulating, God is, that's a lie. God's not with me, that's a lie. God's not going to help me, that's a lie. God abandoned me years ago, that's a lie. 
in the middle of troubles and traumas, Satan loves to come and the demons love to come and from a distance just throw a little, little arrow in voluntary communication. A feeling or a thought that affects you adversely that is contrary to the truth, the word of God. So when our freedom encounters, we'd say, let's pray for the Spirit of God to ha- that right now to make us aware of any of those arrows. You ever see the old uh, movies, the old westerns or cartoons where the Indians and the cowboys are fighting, the cowboys show up at the ranch, they got an arrow in their hair, and they got an arrow in their butt, and they got an arrow you know, where they got hit or whatever. That, a lot of Christians walking into churches like that. Satanic lies carry the ability to bring oppression. Gripping a lie from the enemy can become a stronghold then and allows the oppression of the enemy. The word of truth, when we accept the word of God and hold to the truth, the Holy Spirit brings his power, his presence. So in the midst of some of the freedom encounters, it might not be a demon in you, but if it's a lie inside of you, there needs to be an exchange. Here's the lie. Here's a scripture. For every lie I've found, every lie that somebody has had, there's a scripture that's true. Romans 1 says that fallen humanity exchanged the truth of God for a lie. We need to exchange the lie for truth. Half of Christians who are depressed are not depressed. They are oppressed. You're trying to get rid of your depression just by talk. And you're not getting rid of it. Because it's not depression. You might feel depressed, but because of oppression. If you have not learned how to clear the air around you. We're saved to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be filled with the power of the Spirit of God, to be filled with a liberation, a love, a joy, a peace, a patience, a kindness, right? But when a believer has constant oppression over them, there's a number of reasons for that. Grieving the spirit, quenching the spirit, crippling the believers. And sometimes that involves uh, the lies that have gotten in that that have kept us crippled. And that's important for us to recognize. So if you're, how many are recognizing some things? You don't have to say what it is. How many are recognizing some things right now? Okay, very good. Very good. Whether that's occult doors, family lines, whatever it might be, traumas, uh, lies that have come in like this. And there's, there's a few other things, but these are the basics. So if any of this, what do I do with this? Well, each one may be a little bit different. If it's family lines, just simply, Lord, I want to come before you to make sure. I want to renounce anything my family's ever been in. In the name of the Lord Jesus, by the blood of the Lamb, I, I am now owned by Jesus Christ, and I renounce anything they've ever done, and I'm going to shut the door on any demons that think they have rights. In the name of Jesus, you do not have rights. And, and just simply cutting them off, that sense, in that sense of prayer and commitment. A renunciation of saying, you have no right in my life as a believer, even through my family line. Secondly, when it comes down to um, open doors, Lord Jesus, I realize now the sleep paralysis or the visitation or the cloud over my life. I open doors. I've never shut the door. Maybe the Ouija board, maybe the occult object, maybe it's in your house. I renounce this. I renounce the doors I've ever opened. In the name of Jesus Christ, I give the enemy no room. And then burn the stuff. Get rid of it. Burn it. Again, this is very, very just simple and light level. Associations. Lord, I used to date that one person, and man, they were really weird, and I felt things, and they used to light candles, and they used to do this. Or just out and out sin. I want to renounce that. I want to say, Lord, forgive me. I want to break off any connection to the other person. Some people call these soul, soul ties and things like that. Uh, I, I, I want to break off any and all associations that open the door to the enemy. And if you're in one, you have to choose the will of God, which is good, pleasing, and perfect, or your way. You have to choose that. And uh, sometimes, but if you ask the Lord to lead you, I love, uh, I think it's Isaiah 48. I am the Lord your God, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, who teaches you what is best and leads you in the way you should go. No one can lead you better, right? So we look at these doors, take a look at the lie issues. Just by a show of hands, you don't have to tell me what, but if anybody... 
all of a sudden, you know what, I found, I found there's a lie that's been lodged in my life that's contrary to the word of God. Just a raising of hands. There's a lot of us that can have that. And half the battle is recognizing. The other half is, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I recognize this as a lie, of a, as a, you know, one of these fiery darts of the enemy. I renounce that. I'm not going to hold on to that. I renounce that. Get out in the name of Jesus. Here's the truth. Hebrews 13, I will never, 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 never leave you or forsake you. Truth, the acceptance and the holding of truth brings the Spirit of God's operating presence to witness it to it in your life. Truth brings God's power and operating presence. Lies brings oppression and Satan's crippling. Next page over. There's also around us those who are possessed. From possession to salvation, possession means the demonic total control and manifestation. This is, uh, this is Mark 5, very clearly. Uh, completely controlled, diaminozoid, possessed. Uh, the demonic um, must be removed to get saved when it's full possession like this. If you have somebody manifesting full possession in front of you, if you say you want to get saved, the demon's going to just puke on you. <laughs> Or spit on you or just cuss God or curse. Uh, I've learned you don't give them time. You don't let them take charge. You take charge. Jesus never asked anybody whether they wanted to be delivered. Nor did any disciple, nor did anybody else in scripture. They just did it. And in all of those cases, in 99% of the cases we've seen, unsaved people possessed got saved right away. Immediately. Like Lanny. Uh, immediately. Only one case Federal officer's wife, who's now dead, so I'll mention her name, Margie. A demon spirit named Orion. Two pastors were praying. I was one to get this demon to leave, and she was wanting to hold on. She was a priestess that came up, and um, we commanded Orion to get out. And a matter of fact, at one point, the other pastor commanded, in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord? And this demon barely could say the word Jesus. I mean, just wretchedly, you just, you just, just hated it. And this priestess were, was like angry at the demon spirit Orion. We prayed again in the name of Jesus, and we prayed, and we prayed, and Orion left. She fell to the floor. She got up. She says, I will have him back. And to this day, and into the day she died, we prayed for her. We gave her a lot of time. We really wanted her to get saved. But unless something happened years after she left us, my only belief would be that more demons came back and that she became worse than she was. So um, in the majority, the 99% of the cases, demonized, manifesting people, just in the name of, just do it, Mark chapter 5. Just do what we see Paul do in Acts chapter 16 or 19. You know what happens there? Get out in the name of Jesus. Okay, ekbalo is the Greek words. Now I want you to hear this. You carry the authority of Jesus. Whether you feel it or think it or think you're worthy of it, get rid of that junk. Jesus says in Luke's ten, in Luke ten, I have given you authority. Perfect tense. The moment of salvation, abiding result. It's a living thing in you right now. I have given you authority to tread upon the scorpion, the snake meaning the figures of demons, to Nike, to overcome with decisive victory all the power of the enemy, and nothing will harm you. There is the, the idea of a simple appropriation. How do you, how do you know, you know, again, and, and I've, did this, I've done this for six years across the nation, 90% of believers didn't even realize um, or know the authority. And what I'm saying is you're missing a massive piece of your ability to stay full of the Spirit and free and, and clear and clearing the battlefield because um, that authority is, is massive when it's used and expressed against the dark side. Look what occurs in Acts chapter 8. Mark it down. Acts chapter 8. Philip, a second generation Christian, filled with the Spirit of God, goes into a, you know, the church is being scattered and, and there's all kinds of persecution. He goes into Samaria, a town filled with demons. 
and uh, Simon the Magus, the, uh, the magician there. And he goes into this town, and the high people, the low people, are mesmerized by the, by the, de- the, the demonized priest. And Philip goes in and begins to unleash the gospel, begins to pray for people to be healed. And then the scripture says, demons went out screaming. And after it was all done and said, the city was full of joy. There was an exchange in the atmosphere of the city. When revivals come and thousands get saved, uh, a whole atmosphere changes in a city, a town. When there's no revival and the church is suppressed and quiet and and, and, and almost like it doesn't even exist. Who's, if your city is oppressed, who has precedent? Important to know, important to know what we need to do. Revivals, when we're praying for God to come in big ways. And we've been doing this for years and years, even in this region. We have maps of all, I have a map of all Northeast Ohio over in Pennsylvania. And, and that's prayed for and prayed for and prayed for and prayed for. Does anybody want to see 10,000 people get saved? 20,000 people get saved. I don't care how close to the end it is. I still think God is doing what he does. He didn't back up. He didn't back away. His power hasn't faded. More darkness means what? We can shine all the brighter. Philippians chapter 2. You are uh, in a crooked, depraved generation. The Greek word is, you are the luminaries. Shining in a dark place. You're, You're the one shining. Holding out the word of life. The Illuminati, forget that. The Spirit of God uses the word illumin. You're you're the illuminator. You're the you're the bright shining one in a dark and depraved end of the world. None of this has to keep you from being fully manifesting in the the full full power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The fearlessness that should be there, the love of God that should be there, the willingness to give your life away to reach the world. When have you gone to the highways and byways? We have to ask the question in the suppression and crippling of the church, does anybody care for the lost anymore? You tell me the answer to this. Are most people not getting saved because they don't want to or because they're not hearing the gospel? I bet you if you went out and you shared the gospel powerfully to 15 people this next week, a third of them will get saved right away. Powerful testimonies. I'm waiting to see how much, how much deeper God... God's going to do some deeper work in Mike. This is, he, just, he turned over those deck of cards. He gave up his amulet that had power on it. He's just now surrendered everything. He is, he's excited to be out. He texted us a couple weeks ago. He wants to tell the world that he's out and he's free. But he's got growth to go through. And that only means more of the power of God and the grace of God inside of his life. That is a possession. You know, when demons are manifesting, just take charge. Don't do what Pastor Joey Johnson did. You know Joey? Anybody here know Joey Johnson? House of the Lord. We invited him to a shadow of the darkness. We, years ago, we used to have banquets. We had a banquet. Joey came over and preached for us. I gave him a bunch of books. He's all excited, you know. And He preached 30-some messages on spiritual warfare. He said at the church. and So he preaches at this thing, and he's up there saying about the, the work of the demonic. All this, and all this is going on, and if some demonized person comes to you, if, if some person comes to you that has demons in their life, here's what you do. And he pointed over at me and says, take them over to Russ. <laughs> I took a hammer out and started going like this. <laughs> no. um, I'm like, joke, Joey. Train 2,000 Christians in your church to be a soul winner, to pray for the sick, right. to give some food. Yeah. Give, give your shoes if you need to. You'll get another pair. How many people have more than one pair? That's right. Ladies? <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I probably have. My wife got, she said, how come you have like nine pairs of boots? Because I'll find this pair, the old pair. I, I, one reason, I don't want to throw them away. Yeah. I don't know why I'm keeping them either, but... Um, So give it to goodwill. Whatever we need to do, give it to people. You know, we have more than we need. Francis Shaver said, he called this in America and the Western world, the non-compassionate use of accumulated wealth. So in in the gospel, in all of what the gospel is, live it all out. You ever, you ever hear the hymn, though none go with me, still I will follow? You have to do that. Not everybody's going to do it. You have, if you're the loner, look at Philip in Acts chapter 8. He was a loner. He devastated that city with the kingdom of God. He devastated that city with the kingdom of God. 
second generation believer, sold out to Jesus. Stay obedient, you'll stay hot. Stay obedient, you'll stay filled. Stay obedient, you will grow. Stay obedient, you'll come through your problems. Stay obedient, you know, even in the midst of things. Oppression. Oppression. What is oppression? The presence of Satan or demons targeting you with the goal of defeating you. It's that idea again of darkness on you. I feel like a cloud's over me. Things like that. The bottom here talks about again those arrows. Um, they have the demonic sins communication through involuntary thoughts or involuntary feelings. If they can just thrust a feeling. If all of a sudden you can identify, I have a feeling... Um, I, have, I, get a, I don't feel like reading my Bible. If you felt that way for the last two weeks, you got a problem with your feelings. Yeah. Did you know that in the construct of humanity, that feelings are neutral? They follow your cognitive thinking. All that you think, all that's running in your head, affects your feeling. Yeah, so if I say, how are you feeling? Not too good. It's because whatever you've been thinking, defeat, falling, you know, whatever's going on up here. So a lot has to do with where, you know, you're walking the Lord, your belief in the Lord, you're casting your cares to him. You know, Philippians chapter 3, be anxious for nothing, you know, commit it all, you know, and the peace of God will transcend your understanding. We, could, we, could we learn something as Christians? That obedience to the word of God is powerful and blessed and good and, and healthy and, and pre preserves us. But knowing all of the word of God, when we know the authority of Jesus, when oppression comes, I years ago said, in the middle of doing lots of deliverances and being taken to ritual sites and digging up bones and doing all these things and finding out people sending me blood things and bones and putting things on our car, a bullet on a car, blood, uh, you know, symbols and languages on, on vehicles, calling us with strange languages over the phone, cursings. This authority is to tread, trample the dark side, to overcome with victory all the power of the enemy. So I begin to pray, how far do you use this? Lord, how far can I go with this? I want to use the authority of the Lord. One was, in your own life, when you feel oppression and you feel things around you, I've learned to do this. If I begin to feel like something's going on, I'm praying, Lord, what's going on here? In the name of the Lord, I will pray and command everything away from me, and you know, away from me until there's an exchange, until I feel the power of the Spirit of God instead of the oppression of the enemy. Exchange. If I can identify thoughts. Now, part of this comes from Colossians chapter 2, if you mark it down. I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. The Spirit of God says to all believers, be, uh, be devoted to prayer. Be committed to prayer. Being watchful with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. I understand the prayer part. I understand giving thanks. Thanks, 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 thanks. Build your faith up, thanking the Lord for all kinds of things in your life. Count your blessings, name them one by one. You know that one? That's Psalm 103, by the way. Okay? Who's trained you to be watch, watching? Christians know how to pray. Christians know how to give thanks. But not a whole lot know what that middle word means. Being watchful. Of who? It's the Greek word gregoruo. It's used in 1 Peter chapter 5. Be sober-minded, alert, because your enemy is prowling around seeking someone to devour, to swallow whole. It's predatory. He wants to cripple the believer. And so, and so Gregoruo is a practice. Just as I practice praying in the middle of my prayer, I'm just so used to it. In the midst of my praying, in my quiet time during the day or whatever, um, it's just an automatic thing. Lord, give me a heads up. Is the enemy going on? Do you know what the word Gregoruo is? The, the best Greek definition of the word Gregoruo is from Kenneth Wiest, the Greek scholar from Wheaton. L searching for impending danger. Looking for the impending danger with vigilance. Lord, what is the enemy doing against my family? What is, the enemy, what is the enemy doing coming towards me? You know, we pray, you know, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, worship. The intercession part, dealing with any kind of sin in our life, and um, uh, keep us from the evil, you know, deliver us from the evil one. That's in that Lord's prayer part. It, that, that disciple's prayer is kind of like just an outline that covers everything. Worship, intercession, our own personal sin issues. Who to forgive? And what about our own, the enemy? 
deliver me from the enemy. So, as a believer, it is normal to worship. It is normal to unleash intercession. It is normal to Gregoruo to watch. Please note that the more you know about biblical spiritual warfare, the stronger and more fearless you become. And the more manifest is the Spirit of God in your life through those truths, those, those scriptures that you're putting into your life. With Holy Spirit discernment, Lord, is, what is going on? Is there anything going wrong? Now I know this, no matter during the day, whatever else, if I feel something, if I sense something, if all of a sudden I feel hit with something, where is this coming from? You know, so taking one step back to take a little bit of time to simply say, Lord, I want to see if there's any impending danger. Don't you do that before you pull out on the expressway? Anybody drive here with your eyes closed? Why do we live our spiritual lives sometimes that way? By the way, we have some folks here from, is it from Charlotte? Where, where, where? Yes. They're telling, they come from Charlotte. Wow. Brother's telling me, he's, he's telling me it took him nine hours, uh, well, six hours to drive. Is that correct? So I just want to say thank you for driving all that way and coming up here and being a part. Enormous. But there are some folks here that have you beat. We have some Canadians over here on the, on the right. I, I spied them. So we welcome, we welcome our brothers and sisters from, from, from Canada. It's going to get pretty cold up there. Um, we're at a quarter after. Let me give you a little bit more, then we're going to open up for a few questions. I, I wish I could just pour into more of this. Um, communication is designed on this next page, page 27. It's designed when the enemy is bringing oppression and so forth against you with any kind of uh, darts of the enemy, the, the involuntary feelings and thoughts. It's designed to run contrary to the will of God, contrary to the word of God, contrary to the character of Christ, and contrary to the mission of Jesus. That's what it's all about. That oppression has come to cripple you. That oppression has come to interrupt you. That oppression has come to stop you in the mission of Jesus. And if you can identify the feeling or thought and then say, man, this is not from God. To rebuke that, to renounce that, to, to reiterate the truth of the word of God. There's, I've learned this. You can get rid of depressive, oppressive feelings, not in five days, in five minutes. Amen. Amen. Clear the air in five minutes. Attack. What is attack when a spiritual, uh, when you're going through attack? Well, let me just re remind you of Job. Job went through attack. Ephesians 6 is all about the evil day. When the evil day, put the full armor of God on because when the evil day comes, um, that is attack. Well, let's look what I say about the attack. An orchestrated agenda over a period of time of aggressive spiritual warfare that can affect everything and every, uh, anything and everything you have with a targeted purpose to kill, still destroy. Remember Job. The four things. To cripple. When an attack comes is to cripple you. B, to steal from you. C, to compromise you. D, ultimately, to destroy you. So spiritual attack doesn't just come as an oppressive thing that you can get rid of right away. It comes as an orchestrated thing when all of a sudden everything that's happening, breakdown of the family, breakdown of the car, breakdown of the finances, sickness and stuff, feelings, people arguing, all kinds of uncanny things are collectively going on, like in Job's case. Satan touched a bunch of things together over a period of time with one goal, to drive him to the ground and to curse God. The method of Satan is to hit you up hard and get you to blame God. Blame it all on God. The best thing in the midst of all of that is to recognize when you're under attack, as you're being hit in prayer and in praise, hit back harder. You hold the line by hitting back harder through prayer and praise so that when you do come out of this, you come out bigger and stronger like a oaks of righteousness. Instead of on the other side, all you did was yell, scream, cuss, cry, and sit under the bed. If you go through an attack of 10 days and you come out the other side regretting every action you did, it's time to learn. You know what? Anytime, and again, they're not always fun when you have really you know, big attacks. 
You know, we've seen some stuff in our family that has been horrendous, um, even, even lately. Devastating, some devastating things. But I just know this, that if you stand in, in the presence of God, cling to every word of God, go ahead and give praise to God, keep up the prayers, keep striking out of the enemy, fight! Fight in the midst of the attack! Sorry, I needed to do that. Okay? Shout unto God with a voice of triumph, right? There's something to that. And to unleash praise and thanksgiving and call others in prayer, sometimes I believe you can shorten the attack's length and severity. And when you come out on the other side, you come out smelling like heavenly roses instead of uh, charcoals, right? Yeah, sometimes we do. You come out of it. <laughs> so, and the only thing you can do is just, uh, you, you, you know, when you're going through, when you're going through a battle with hell over a period of five days, and all of a sudden you realize, this is, you know, I thought I dealt with this yesterday, but here it is today, here it is, and by the time you're in the third day, you're under attack. If it's all these objects in your life hitting, it's all under attack, and say, Lord, what is it the enemy wants against me? You know, give me insight, Lord. What is it that he wants, what, what, what is he trying to do? The Lord's, he, you know what? And under the attack, one of the big things the enemy tries to bring is such an oppression in that attack that you don't think God's anywhere. And there's silence for a little bit of time. Did God speak to Job right away? Towards the end, he did. Job held out. He never cursed God. He got the victory. But even more of a victory, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ears, but now my eyes, not my eyes have seen you, and I repent in dust and ashes. Did he get back his property three times as much? Now that's cool. But the last chapter says the second half of Job's life was better than the first. That is used in the book of James chapter 5. Remember the patience of Job and what the Lord finally brought about. God could restore things in your life, restore things that you feel have been stolen, can bring back to you so many things. You know, you cling to God, you bind yourself to heaven's throne, you keep yourself praising up, you, you just lay on the floor, cry and praise, do whatever you need to do. But don't budge, because you will come out the other side of an attack, and you can come out powerful. You can, you know, like rings in the tree, you, you, you can grow powerfully. Because if you respond well in the midst of things, it has a lot to do with response. James chapter 1 the Spirit of God, com you know, commands, it's a command. Um, count it pure joy when you face Philip's troubles of many kinds. Pure, the word means unadulterated, unmixed. Count it a joy. Well, because I'm going through this? No, because of what's going to happen to you. Count it pure joy because what? The testing of your faith pushes you into perseverance. And the perseverance will bring about an incredible solid character. So if you stand in faith today and praise today, stand in faith tomorrow and praise tomorrow, stand in faith each day, you, you get up to exert, resist the devil, you know, he'll flee. You get up to exert your will and worship and praise and stand instead of being suppressed by it all, then you will come out spiritually larger, stronger, and more powerful than ever. Under attack. Ready for the next. Quite, well, I, mean, I don't have that time right now. Uh, let's go here. Um, I want to give you this other one. Uh, we dealt with um, attachment. I got to deal with attachment. I got to deal with attachment. Oh, man. Uh, look at the top of the page of, uh, what is that, 26? 28? Thank you. Mine's a little faded here, you know. Um, attachment. What do I mean by Attachment. If, um, well, let, let's, let's read the definition here. It is the grip of a demon or Satan on a believer or in a believer in the area of belief or action, a fleshly foothold, that a believer has chosen to get into. The believer has given the right to the enemy. So as a believer, we read this in Ephesians chapter 4. What does it say? Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger and give the devil a foothold. So the command is, don't give the devil a foothold. Topos, a legal right to actually grab a hold of that area of anger and hold it in even stronger. 
Any act in the flesh, if you get into it, here, let's say here's the line. I'm walking in the spirit, filled with joy, singing the Lord, everything's cool. But all of a sudden, I get, some, and I get, in, I get into the flesh. I get into anger, lust, greed. I start to lie about something. If you get into any area of the flesh long enough and strong enough, somewhere the enemy has the right to grab that and hold that and make it a stronghold. You did that. That's not oppression and that's not even attack. All Christians will have oppression and attack. But any Christian that has given the devil a topon, a right, uh, you've given the foothold. What do you do about that? Any Christian, well, you know what, I'm going I'm to try that Ouija board out. You've just, you've just clear over here. How many have gone to the zoo before? Anybody stick your arm into the grillish cage? When you get into the flesh, that's what you do. Sooner or later, it's, you know, that thing's going to come over and grab you. That's what's going to happen. And so what if a believer has, you know, they're like, I got this going on. I can't get rid of it. I can't, I don't know. I tried, you know. And they got this or their anger is really big or their lust is really big or their, or their greed is really big or their lie is really big. Because the enemy has grabbed a hold of. Two things that any believer can do, some call this auto-deliverance. To recognize that you have to recognize, but to repent and to renounce yeah. is where you're going to get freedom. Unless you give that up and come back over here on this side, shutting the door, you're going to have a lot of grief. You're grieving the spirit. You're quenching the spirit. And sooner or later, the father's discipline will come into your life. He loves those who, you know, he disciplines. And if we don't listen to the word, we don't listen to the spirit of God, we don't listen to other Christian friends... The father that loves you knows how to deal with you. He knows how to, you know, that end over there. He knows how to do what he needs to do to spank you, to get you to say, I hate this, and come right back over here. In the Old Testament, God said, Moab is my wash pot. He used a, a, a pagan nation to come and, and, and deal with Israel so they would run back and, and come out of the paganism and compromise. Uh, anybody under discipline? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand, but... Um, so attachments, how do I know I have one? If you know, knowingly know that you're into anger and bitterness, or any of the sins of the flesh, Galatians 5. If you've opened the door to psychics and readers and whatever else, if you open the door and given the devil the right, then all of a sudden it's really a strong issue, really a big issue, then, then you need to do this. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge this. Don't blame it on anybody else. That would be Satan's trick to get you to blame everybody else because you won't move anywhere. If it's you that did it, you got to repent. Lord, I repent of this anger. I repent of this thing. I forgive this person. Your response is important. Your obedience to the word is important. And so I, renou I, re I repent of this sin that has opened the door, and I renounce you know, what I've done. And you could even do this. And after you, after you have recognized and repented and renounced this, instant forgiveness, instant refilling of the Spirit of God... You can also do this, and I suggest, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. No more of this will I give to you. That could be a recognition. You can say that. There's no problem saying that. No prohibition. We looked at uh, possession. I want to give you one more thing, and then we'll ask for questions. The next page uh, is piggyback. A demon attacking you by using a person who is possessed or deeply in the flesh, attached to and or influenced, influencing another person. Demons in and on others know you and will be ready to fight, harm, and um, harass you. So, you can have a lost person that has demons on them. Do the demons in them see you know who you are? The demon inside that guy in that little room with the sons of sheep. Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? And he attacked them. And he beat them to a pulp. They were bloody running out of the building. A demon did that in a person. Possessed. A demon on a person. You can walk into a restaurant. You can be in a workplace. You can be somewhere else. And a demon on this person can recognize. That demon can get that person to be pretty mean to you. A Christian who has opened the door and has attachment or even oppression on them over here getting all mad and angry, we call it getting in the flesh, 
can say something to you where the enemy that wants to say something direct, but you, you're shielded, instead of that, the enemy's going to use somebody else's flesh to piggyback over them to try to strike you so that a Christian around you could have hurt you. They were in the flesh. They were in under attachment or whatever it may have been, but they hurt you, right? And if you could recognize that, when Peter was coming, Jesus was heading one way. Peter, all of a sudden, Jesus turns around and he said, what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Who was he addressing, Peter or, the, or Satan? Because in that instance, before Pentecost, the indwelling of the Spirit of God, Satan came to influence Peter to get Jesus to reroute what he was doing. You got mission, you got things to do. Satan can use people to reroute you. Go in soul winning, phone call comes in, reroute you. Go on the mission field, something about money, reroute you. You know? So you got to be, if you can be a little bit of aware, again, watching, prayer, watching, and also thanksgiving. So if you're sensitive that to the, you know, the Spirit of God and someone says this, you're like, hmm. And all of a sudden you realize that the enemy is trying to piggyback over someone in the flesh someone that's lost, Christians that's deeply into anger or whatever else, and you recognize that, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, Satan or demon. Get out of here. Now, there's times I've had fleshly, angry believer where there was a piggybacking coming right over, and I said out loud, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke the demon trying to use you. You can do that. In some cases, it will cause the person to drop to their knees and serve the Lord and say, I know, man, I'm sorry. I've been into the flesh. I really, I really apologize. And they get free. Use your authority and, and recognize whether it's possession, whether it's oppression, whether it's attack, whether it's piggybacking. And, and, and here we are at 430, and I wanted to take you to some of the new levels. What if you have people around you where you work in your neighborhood that are summoning demons and sending them at you? What if they're doing spells and dropping things off on your porch? It's gonna, I'm going to tell you now it's going to happen more because the sheer numbers of practitioners in Santeria, Palo Maombi, uh, the Saint of Death, uh, Wicca, all kinds of brands of Wicca, New Age, uh, paganism, uh, charged objects to be given to you. I mean, look at, I mean, even in voodoo, Vodan, Cantabili, so, so many of these, they know how to bring curses and spells and hexes and apply them against you. And we want to say quickly, you know, the, hey, no undeserved cursing in the land or whatever else. And that's true. There is a sense that we're shielded. But there's also a sense that they have opened doors at times, and they're doing something to send something. Now, over the years, there's times I've woken up in the middle of the night. Anybody wake up around 3 o'clock? <laughs> Covens meet between 12 by the time they re the demons are released just before 3, right around 3. Satanists know how to target pastors by name, bring things out of the church, and bring it to the rituals. Here's what I'm going to tell you on an experiential level. This is a little bit subjective. If there are rituals being done or a spell being done, the effect seems to be like somebody at the door. You ever have somebody pound on your door and it really startles you? They do it really loud and hard. Spiritually speaking, a summoning of a demon and sending against you can really, all of a sudden, a real sense of something is coming to the house. You ever get up and walk around with your weapon? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Do that with the authority of Jesus. Clear the house. If you ever feel that something has been coming in the scent, again, who do you have to say? Remember Acts 8? Did I mention Acts chapter 8? Philip, second generation believer, filled with the Spirit. He quoted the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, go, walk, go over there and stand by that chariot. Right? And he led the man to Christ. Can the Holy Spirit do that in prayer? Do we not know how to listen to the voice of God? Father, what's going on in my house right now? What's going on? See what the Spirit of God says. Nothing gets past God. It might have been God that woke you up, not the demon. See what's going on, and then, and then just, that's, that's praying in the full scope of the Spirit. 
In Ephesians 6, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers, you know, for all the saints. Locative of spirit in the Greek meaning, in the spirit of it and the power and the full workings of the spirit of God, pray in that power. Why pray in any other power? When you can pray guided and directed by the spirit of the Lord. Sometimes you've got to take time to listen. It's interaction. He, you're, you're a temple of the spirit of God. He wants to teach you. He wants to guide you. He will speak to you where, where you can quote what he says. He'll never speak contrary to the word. You know that. Contrary to the character of Christ. You know that. And contrary to the mission of God. He'll never do that. So don't worry. John 10. My sheep know my voice. They're not going to listen to another. Know him well. Know him well. In 40 years, it's the same Jesus. It's the same voice. It's the same one that I know. I'm familiar. You hear this voice right here? How many here have seen me for the first time after listening today? I've been listening on radio, okay. Do I look what I sound like? I remember I used to listen to Raul Reese out of California, and I went to go see him. You know, I thought he was good. I didn't, I didn't have any ideas he's going to look like Cheech and Chong. <laughs> he had blue jeans on. He had a, a rope for a belt. Nicest, nicest brother in the Lord you could meet, though, Raul Reese. Nicest great brother, 5,000 member, powerful growing church. Powerful, good, good guy, good brother. But I used to listen to him. And the truth is, I always thought he looked like some, you know, I thought he was like some, you know, like he just, I would think some, like, some, like, a, business, like, a, like a pastor, businessman. You know, came out around his desk, T-shirt on, these old blue jeans, ragged blue jeans, and a, and a rope for a belt. And the first thought was, do I need to buy him a belt? <laughs> um, you know this voice? I mean, really, do you know this voice? If I was to walk in the room, if you hear this voice, please understand, do you hear the voice of the Lord? My sheep will know my voice. So in the middle of the night when you get up, just, Lord, what's going on here? Give me the heads up, Lord, and wait on the Lord. It's better to be able to take your powerful prayer and aim it at the right way than just to throw it out everywhere. But sometimes I just throw it out everywhere. Just, I'm going to cover everything, you know, kind of like a machine gun, you know, just praying and covering everything. So if there's any demons coming in here, we're going to just unleash on you. But many millions of believers across the United States and other parts in the last number of decades have been experiencing middle of the night visitations. But middle of the night visitations involve astral projectors for one and all of the ritual workers. And if there are 10 million, let's say 5 million practitioners of the SRA, they're doing rituals. They know how to. They know who to target. And they do them from midnight on and usually are done close to 3 to release at 3 o'clock. And if you're the target, demons can visit your home or wherever you're at. And you know what you can do? rebuke them, and, and, and you can send them back, by the way, ordering them. You have a, you got to understand you're allowed to order them. Mm -hmm. The bewitching hour. What else? And I needed to say, too, before we close anything up yet, because um, I've been asked this, and I just came back to my mind, where do, you, where do you cast demons? Out of people. Here's what some of the books over the years, and I've tried to read everything out there, uh, are saying, well, just cast them to the feet of Jesus and, and tell them they have to do whatever Jesus says. That's a good idea, but it never happened in Scripture once. Okay, so I don't do it. Second, well, just cast them to the abyss. Well, it wouldn't be too quick. Nobody did that either, although they feared Jesus doing that. So years ago, I tried it a few times in this, this sense. In hard, hard, hard satanic ritual abuse cases where very powerful demons would... <laughs> You know, another hundred connected to them where one in the ruling spirit is speaking. You know, I ain't coming out. We have run rights. You know, you're coming out in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the name of Jesus, I command that you know he's here and he's present right now. Ah, stop this. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you are going to come out of this person. No, I am not. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're not going to come out right now by the authority of the Lord, I'm going to ask him to send you to the abyss. No! That's about how it went. A couple of times. There was only one time I asked the Lord if I could send the demonic presence in this person, uh, this vile stuff that include, I believe, the killing of a 12-year-old to the abyss. And I felt, I felt led by the Spirit of God to go ahead and do it. Demons don't want to go there. What did Jesus do? 
Ek or ek balo. Come out, get out, he said sternly. With children, don't yell at them. If you have demonized kids, don't, you, don't, you don't have to yell to get them out. And don't take your Bible and slam them on the head. Don't play games and do this or say, I got holy water, I'm going to throw it up. Oh, look, they're like, ha, 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 you know. Don't do this. You ever see that on television or some things? Did you ever see Jesus or any apostle do that kind of stuff? That's all, I believe, carnal showmanship. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with the compassion to get a person free. It has everything to do with the authority of Christ and the only way to do this. So what do we do when we say, get out of them? You have to have that in your mind, what Jesus did. Jesus did it. Paul did it in Acts. You just get out of. Well, where do they go? Well, there's times I'll say, get out and never come back. Because they're legalists. But the truth is, if you think in terms of this being a human being, and they're possessed with a demon, this is the dividing line right here. The demons have to have a right to get in a person's life, right? There has to be somewhere a right. How did they get in? So they get a right to get into the life, and they're possessed or whatever. So when you command them to go out and take away those rights, you're taking away those rights, by the way, commanding them to go out, where do they go? Onto the other side. Back from whence they came they will have to look for rights again. And if this person has turned to Jesus and now has the Spirit of God in them, in the demons look, there's no rights to come back and bring seven others. So when you do cast them out, they go out of the realm of rights, back from whence they came. They will have to reseek rights. They will have to reseek the rights to get somewhere, to get in somebody else's life. Okay? couple experiences of uh, early deliverances, little girl this big, sweetest little thing, little dress, manifest demonically in a church. It was an orange church I was in, <laughs> building, and this little girl manifested, went crawling into things. Every foul word you could think of was coming out of her mouth, declaring that, she's gonna, that Satan's going to break my wife's arm. So the mother finally got a hold of her brother all the way in front. I put my arms around this fighting, I mean, snarling, fighting, screaming little girl. And I said, stop in the name of Jesus. She went instantly limp. And the demon jumped back on the mom from whence it came. And the mom went to the floor, howling. One person started some kind of crazy war dance. <laughs> They've never been in deliverance. One person just started saying, Jesus, 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 okay? Um, and then a couple others just began to pray, get out in the name of Jesus. And all of a sudden, she was set free. Um, so I will only say that in the midst of doing deliverance and having the ability to command is, is just, again, just know that you're, you're listening to the Spirit of God and all of it. Take charge immediately. Order them. You don't have to I don't care if they say, you don't have authority. You're not a good Christian. I'm going to get your family. Shut up! Okay, in the name of Jesus. You don't have to yell. I'm just trying to emphasize it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just trying to emphasize. Sometimes I just sit so sick of them. I mean, when they, ah, rah, 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 you know, like that. I say, ah, shut up, you know, in the name of Jesus, you know. Um, and, and get out of them right now. Now, there's times I felt, I have felt led to say, and never come back. Go and never come back. Or you will not touch anybody in the room. Because when a spirit comes out, they may look quickly, is there any holes anywhere? Like a mouse running for, you know, wherever they're going to find a hole to get into, right? So in a room, when something happens, it's possible that somebody who has a door over here already, they might just whoop right there and you'll see an immediate effect. So get out of here, you will not touch anybody. So there's times that we'll command a demon, even when they're not showing themselves right away, come forward without any harm to the person. But in casting them out, if there's other people in the room, uh, or if it's happened anywhere else, I mean, we, we've been at McDonald's and it happened right in the middle. We've been in cars where it's happened. We've been, we've been to a lot of different places where it just happened. Um, we were at the um, Angel Falls Coffee House up there in Highland Square one night because we were called to come up there and get this one guy. Randy in the back with the long hair and the beard was with me. And, and uh, this guy was a professor at the University of Akron. And we we're talking to two new age little girls trying to witness to the girls. And this guy begins to manifest. I said, we, I said Randy, let's go, we better get him out of here. 
So we get into my old, old Ford truck I had at the time, put him in the middle, Randy's over here, we're driving down in the valley, and all of a sudden he just fully manifests. So loud and so hard, the entire truck is shaking. And I'm having to drive and hold him with one elbow, and Randy's holding him with his other elbow, and we're both praying, commanding the spirit, and the demon is yelling, no, no, and just fighting and so forth. So you're going to have situations when you see this. Here's the vital part, too, in, in casting out any demons with the authority. You have the right. You have authority. You don't have to say Jesus' name a thousand times. Hear me clearly. You don't have to say blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus a thousand times either. Blood of Jesus is a good thing. Nothing wrong with saying it. But nobody did it in the deliverance in the New Testament. Okay? Nobody did that. They just, with the authority they had, just rebuked them in the name of the Lord and commanded them to get under Jesus' name. And if you want to say in the blood of Jesus, fine. I'll, I, there's times I do. I'll just, you know, uh, under the blood of the Lamb. And I acknowledge, because there, there's three things they do. Hey, the, the mentioning the blood of the Lamb, mentioning the cross, Colossians 2, where Jesus triumphed over them, making a public spectacle, triumphing over the, by the cross, um, and then just the name of Jesus. But I look how Jesus did it, how he taught it, how the other disciples did it. It's all the same. I've got 300 other books on the subject from a lot of places. Some I would never recommend to anybody. But the truth is, you just come back down to what the teaching is, and there's what you got. So today, um, let's take a little bit of time to do this first of all. I want to do this because I really, really, really want you to... Uh, have some experience in your life, in your heart. It all, you know, just, you know let's just stand together. This won't take long. Let's just stand together. And um, I'm going to pray first, and I'm, gonna have you, I'm just going to lead through some prayer time. Father, I thank you right now. Just, I'm so grateful, God, that you are God, Savior, that you're the Savior, that you're the deliverer of our lives, the Savior of our lives. We pray for the Spirit of God to guide and to lead right now. God, you know, Lord Jesus, you know in this room what is here and who is here and all the things that people have been through. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command that there's any demon hiding. You will not harm anybody, and but yet you will be outed today and be dealt with today in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge you as Savior and Lord. I acknowledge the blood of the Lamb and what you've done at the cross, that you've come into my life, and the Spirit of God is in me. I accept the authority that you have given to me with the responsibility of its mission to tread upon the dark side. To overcome all the power of the enemy. I give myself to Jesus. To the power of the Holy Spirit. To be a soul winner. And to cast out any demon or demons in anyone. As Jesus did. Father in your presence. Search me right now. Are there any lies? Any old doors? any family life, anything that has brought demons towards my life or on my life, any woundedness in the name of the Lord Jesus. I renounce the occult doorways. Anything in my family line in the name of Jesus. I renounce any rights of Satan. 